This video will contain massive spoilers for Death Stranding, so I highly recommend you finish the game first before watching this video. I remember when I was younger, I could play games for hours and not feel the time pass. But as I grew older, I started to not really play for more than a few hours at a time. I felt as though I needed breaks from playing. Not just for the sake of my sore eyes, but because I could only put up with so much gameplay before I got a bit bored or frustrated doing the same activity. For a long time, I wanted to find a title that I could immerse myself into the way I did as a child. I played good games for sure, but I always found it easy enough to put them down and do other things. As someone who has spent the past couple years making Death Stranding analysis and theory videos, I had a lot of hype for its release. In a way, I was expecting my high hopes to be somewhat disappointed, because no way it could meet those standards, right? Well, after almost 90 hours of playtime and a shiny platinum trophy, Death Stranding exceeded even those expectations. And finally, I found a game I could not put down, just like when I was a child. The way Death Stranding handles traversal is unlike any other experience I've had in a game. Just pushing the left analogue stick forward isn't enough. The left and right trigger, along with the ping function, will be heavily used as you make your way through the unforgiving terrains of this world. Especially in the first hours of the game, I was pinging the Odradex sensor every few seconds out of extreme fear of tripping over and damaging my cargo. I've never analysed a video game's environment this much while playing, and without these mechanics, the game would have probably felt empty both in gameplay and surroundings. Interactivity with your environment typically involves ladders and climbing anchors, but there will also be a couple areas where you need to use more specific tools like an oxygen mask. You need to think about what you're going to have to use before setting off, and it was that planning of my journey that felt very fulfilling. Sometimes I would even scout a path to my destination first to see if I would be dealing with BTs or mules, and change my load accordingly. Progression of traversal is fantastically done. While you would expect it to become easier with unlocked equipment, the game continues to have its challenges. This is mostly the case in the snowy mountainous region because of the more difficult terrain, and a section you have to complete without loot, while still coming across BTs. There's also a part where you have to make your way back to Capital Knot City, but all your structures have been removed, and the route is littered with enemies. Loot and structures are definitely things you rely on before this point in the game. So that's why these parts were more challenging, and helped you really appreciate their inclusion while also making you experiment with a different playstyle to what you might have been used to. You can only place zip lines and other structures in areas connected to the chiral network, and provided you have enough bandwidth. Therefore, the first trip to anywhere that isn't a part of the network is all down to you and what you take with you. Online help only comes to you once connected, which is a great way of making trips you've already made a lot easier, and therefore less frustrating and repetitive, while having your own work cut out for you first. I worked hard to get everything connected with zip lines, but of course had to also level up facilities to ensure my bandwidth grew, which is in place so you can't abuse your map by putting structures everywhere. The level of interactivity with your surroundings is astounding, not just from the amount of tools available to you, but also the multiple ways they can be used. A ladder, for example, can be used to ascend and descend a steep slope. However, you can place it across a ravine or body of water too, which you can cross either by foot or by trike. Even the floating carriers which help carry cargo can also be used as a means of transport downhill. Normally, when a game has a lot of features, I don't really end up using most of them, but the things available to you in Death Stranding are actually all useful. I felt like I really got the most out of the game by exploring the different possibilities of traversal, and had a ton of fun doing so. The mechanics felt so damn clever. Combat also has a lot of options available to you. For example, you can run away from most encounters, and for any battles necessary for the story, you have a bunch of different weapons and ammo that can be used. The game is all about traversal for the first few chapters, but then it throws you in a completely new direction in Cliff's Battlefield chapters. These third-person shooter sequences make use of vastly different environments, and a more offensive approach to gameplay, although you must still collect weapons and blood bags you find to make sure you're properly supplied. Combat isn't the game's priority, and killing people is definitely something you want to avoid. I'm not someone who played with lethal weapons, not against mules anyway. I was too paranoid about tainting my map with a void out crater if I negligently left behind a corpse. Even in boss battles, you often had at least a few choices in how you went about it. You could take a stealthy approach using your rope, or just go on full offensive with an assault rifle. You can even use cargo as a weapon too. 
I did have fun invading mule camps and experimenting with different kinds of combat, although it never felt like the main purpose of the game, rather an injection of action. Even the boss battles were short but sweet. I'm very happy with the way it was done, and I'm glad it focused primarily on traversal. The beach things make for a unique enemy, and the encounters with them were tense during the main story. While they become a lot easier to deal with over time, my first experience with them was heart pounding. The consequences of getting caught make you even more scared of the BTs when you're carrying cargo. Not only will they damage your goods, but if a catcher eats you, you will cause a void out and permanently damage the area. There are a couple variations of the gazer BTs, and I remember going to an abandoned factory and noticing a massive BT, so I went back for some weapons and came back to obliterate it, which gave me a nice chunk of chiral crystals. There are a lot of moments like this in the game where you kind of just want to try stuff out to see what will happen. You have that freedom to unleash your creativity and curiosity. There's another type of BT in the form of what I think looks like a jellyfish. They appear not only in Edgenot City and the eastern region during story segments, but also near the edges of the map, particularly near the Ocean of Tar. A beach light setting seems appropriate for them anyway. I didn't find them to be especially dangerous, but seeing a swarm of them floating ominously around a rainy beach was a little unsettling. Humans aren't the only ones who can give you likes, by the way, as BTs will give you one if you cut their cords. They don't belong in this world, so setting them free from it is a positive thing, one that they seem to be thankful for. Hartman says the following about BTs in an interview. And the handprints we see when BTs seek out humans? I'd say that's just evidence of our otherworldly friends yearning to forge a connection. They're reaching out to us, attempting to bridge the gap between the realm of the dead and that of the living. So the reason that BTs try to capture humans is because they're desperately trying to merge the world of the living and the dead. Not necessarily with malicious intent, but just as an instinct to connect with anything they can. By cutting them from their umbilical cords, they become connected to the world of the dead once again, rather than being stranded in ours, grasping at whatever living beings they can catch. The Odradex sensor was a fantastic visual cue for the BT's locations. A lot of the time I wouldn't bother pinging to know exactly where they were, and instead paid attention to where my sensor was pointing and how it was reacting. You learn to navigate through BT territory fairly quickly this way, especially once you learn exactly when you need to start holding your breath. Fish and crabs appear when fighting and defeating a catcher, signifying a greater presence of the beach. An interesting aspect of these battles are that old buildings rise out of the tar, giving you some high ground against the catchers. But this feature is also used in the main story as a necessary means to get to Edge Knot City, where you purposefully allow yourself to be dragged off by BTs and thus create a pathway of buildings. We are used to using them defensively, but here we use them to actually move forward. Death Stranding has a habit of taking away and changing how we look at certain mechanics, helping the player to realise how creative they can be with their gameplay. The fact that buildings are able to be brought out from the tar unaffected also provides a bit of hope for humanity. If humans can solve the problem of tar, maybe they can bring back that which was lost in it. The most important part of Death Stranding in terms of concepts and gameplay are the asynchronous multiplayer aspects. The game is very much about working together to make the environment more easily traversable, which in turn makes it easier to get better grades for deliveries. Contributing materials to upgrade and build structures actually feels purposeful. It will give you enough structures and roads for you to feel the work of other players, but not enough for you to become completely lazy. A lot of it still lies in your hands too. I spent time during my playthrough creating zip lines between all the preppers and distribution centres, making my traversal much easier. But it was also nice to see them gain likes as they help others at the same time. It was because of this I started to think about how my actions could help other players, and I made it my mission to build out all the roads on my map despite not really using them myself. The like system is positive, meaning you can't give dislikes, which is an obvious nod to the negativity that is spread on the internet and social media. If you don't find someone's structure to be useful, or you think it's obstructive, you can just remove it, no need to engage negatively with the creator. There's even commentary on how one can become addicted to likes and validation, those being the mules, which could also extend to how some are with social media in our world too. Die Hardman says, It's believed that an over-dependence on the oxytocin rush provided by these kinds of interactions is a factor in Porter's going rogue. With this in mind, it wouldn't be wrong to characterise mules as oxytocin addicts. In essence, they're social animals at the mercy of validation. 
The theme of connection is detrimental to the story, so to have that reflected so well in gameplay just solidifies it. We truly end up leaving and reconnecting society because of it. We see its benefits, but we feel it too. The feeling of seeing a generator or ladder just when you desperately need one is one like no other. It alleviates that loneliness you experience as Sam wandering alone, knowing that someone else was there and also that someone else had the same predicament. They helped not only themselves, but others too, which can be seen in the form of likes. You can build even deeper connections with other players by using bridge links, so if you find an extremely helpful structure, you can spam the like button, but also add them to that bridge link section so you are more likely to see their other structures too. As I've said, the story very much covers connections, how we can use them as a force for good, but also bad, and when we should sever those connections. The fact that multiple players are present in the world is also reflected in the story by ways of a multiverse. Preppers will sometimes mention in writing how they've seen other porters that look exactly like you in a short space of time. Hartman often describes the beach as a kind of multiverse too, again providing an actual reason as to how we, the players, can share the same map. At first, I thought the piss mushrooms and cans wouldn't have any use. However, once they're big enough, they attract crypto biotes which you can eat and collect, restoring your blood levels should you be low. It also reminds me of the memory chip for the movie Matango, which heavily features mushrooms. The description even likens them to the crypto biotes and their coral, so that's likely why mushrooms were chosen. It seems to imply that the crypto biotes, which are based on the real life tardigrades, may have mutated because they ingested the coral in the seam, which is compared to the mushrooms in Matango that mutated those that ate them. Although they're NPCs, you may sometimes come across other porters who you can speak to and trade with. It's a nice moment of brief company, which you appreciate a lot more given the vast, largely unpopulated overground. Overall, the asynchronous multiplayer of Dust Stranding is incredibly unique and is worth experiencing on its own. Upon starting Death Stranding, you'll be asked to enter in your birthday, and once you do, you'll be met with this message stating that higher levels of dooms has been observed in those born under constellations such as Cancer, Pisces, Cetus, Delphinus, and Gigas. I, along with most people who aren't born in the corresponding months, were probably regretting being honest, but I haven't seen any evidence to suggest that birthdays actually make a difference. Most of the constellations mentioned represent sea creatures, such as crabs, fish, whales, and dolphins, all of which we often see in the game in regards to the beach, so I think it's more of a reference to the beach and its connections with dooms. After all, having dooms means you have a stronger link to it. Death Stranding has a habit of putting meaning into every little detail, this is just one of many. Speaking of which, when it actually is your birthday, the game will celebrate by giving you a fruity cake, which are my personal favourite and having a birthday message sent to you from all Bridges members. Also, when you use the touchpad to call out to other players, you may also get a happy birthday in return. I love wholesome moments in games. Plus, having your birthday and in turn identity injected into the game like this makes you feel a little more connected. And while we're on the subject of wholesome, Lou is the epitome of it. I'm always in support of having a cute little buddy in games, although I am used to them being a dog or another animal, and not a baby in an artificial womb. Regardless, Lou is absolutely charming, but also seriously useful. Seeing BTs even only when standing still is a huge advantage to not seeing them at all. Everyone grows more attached to her as time goes on, particularly Deadman and Sam. They go from seeing Lou as equipment to actually giving her a chance at a real life, even though it's against protocol. We as the player aren't exempt of these emotions either. Lou's little gestures of love can be seen when Sam is sleeping, as she will look up at him lovingly, or even imitate Cliff's gesture, implying that through Sam, Lou also shares his memories and therefore a connection with Cliff. I also loved how the whole time we were told that the memories of Cliff were shared by Lou, when really they were Sam's memories that were just awakened by connecting to Lou. Sam and Lou's connection goes deeper than just their experiences together, as it could also be down to Sam having been a bridge baby himself. Perhaps even subconsciously, Sam had more sympathy for her because of this relation. I personally love the scene where she smushes her face up against the glass pod, and when Deadman and Lou come to get Sam back from the beach, her umbilical cord is in the shape of a heart. Not to mention when you play the harmonica for Lou, she starts doing a little dance. Story-wise, she even protects Sam when Higgs shoots at him, and it's these adorable and personality-filled moments on screen that make her all the more lovable. 
Falling over and hearing you cry made me feel horrible, which other than damaging cargo, gave me another reason to be careful about tripping over. Getting likes from Lou when you made a jump or boosted a vehicle gave you reminders of Lou's presence, and hearing her little coos and laughter was so cute. Because of this undeniable connection I had with Lou, the last chapter where you take her up to the incinerator was unbearable. I was getting really upset because I wasn't sure when Sam was going to try taking her out of the pod, and the tension really built up until the very last second as he grabbed her from the incinerator. I cannot even explain the relief I felt at that moment. The other presumably retired bridge babies surrounding this scene made things a lot more emotional too. On that note, I'm very happy with how the game ended. It emits so much hopefulness, which was the perfect feeling to wrap up this experience. Louise. The surreal and beautiful atmosphere of Death Stranding is undoubtedly my favourite aspect of the game. Breathtaking landscapes matched with the meditative style of gameplay and soundtrack was sure to immerse me into the world. You have these intense moments of isolation throughout the majority of the game, which feels so therapeutic. And although the landscapes are fairly brutal, I would often go out of my way to find a high place, observing what was below. Having a rest and playing the harmonica for Lou was an adorable interruption to the harsh nature of the latter parts of the game especially. Sense of scale contributes to the feeling of isolation. These cruel landscapes that seem to work against us can still offer peaceful moments too. It was when I started to get close to achieving Platinum that I really started to analyse the map. I wanted to visit every corner of the world, and ended up going to places I had completely missed when just going through the main story. I found things that I hadn't seen anywhere else. It felt like a special place, where although many players inhabit this map, finding the unexplored edges felt even more rewarding. I would look at the map, find a spot that looked suspiciously vacant, and then go on a little adventure to see if anything was there. I remember ending up on a BT infested beach, so I went back and got a few guns to just blast them up with. As soon as I disposed of them all, the rain lit up a bit, revealing a tranquil beach. This moment was very memorable for me, because although I loved the multiplayer aspect and sharing a map with others, it was satisfying to find somewhere like this where it looked like no one else had been. The lack of structures and signs was nice, but in contrast to the places that actually needed them, this was a place that was of no benefit to visit. No memory chips, nothing. It was just me and the sound of the rain, which still felt good. When I went back to the first map, I headed over to the incinerator for a memory chip I had missed. It was here that I realised I had missed the entire back half of the structure, and then I noticed something else in the distance. It was a huge crater, one that occupied a pretty big amount of the map. I marvelled at it for a bit, before coming back with equipment to try and go over there. Unfortunately, it didn't work, but I tried. I also tried seeing what would happen if I go down a waterfall, and I don't know what it was about the camera zooming out as you plummet down, but it cracked me up. I had so much fun experimenting with what was possible. The variation of terrains was something you only really experienced when finding all the preppers and memory chips, which isn't necessary for the main story, of course. There was one memory chip which was underneath a tori, a traditional Japanese gate. I wondered how such a thing could exist in a world plagued by timefall. How this ancient structure still stands in this little corner of the map. These gates typically mark the transition between the world of the physical and the spiritual, or the entrance to a sacred place. Maybe there really is something special about this gate that made it so it could stand the test of time. Death Stranding's world is mainly unoccupied, so it's moments of the past like these that feel more meaningful. You can't help but think about all that it has been through. After I got my platinum, I decided to get some interface-free footage for this video, and some nice screenshots too since the photo mode sadly isn't available. It was here when I disabled the user interface that my gameplay changed fairly dramatically. I paid a lot more attention to sound design. For example, the sound of my stamina running out and the battery level of my vehicle or speed skeleton dropping. Also, without the reticle, shooting obviously became a lot more difficult, but not impossible. Without that layer of user interface, it felt as though I was even more immersed into the game. Especially knowing all the controls anyway, I recommend you experiment with this in post-game. It was walking slowly through the detailed landscapes that I really felt something. I struggled to describe it, but all I can think to say was that it was beautiful, which doesn't really cut it. I started to notice more remnants of the past, like cars buried halfway in the ground, covered in moss, or other structures still struggling to stand. The ruined buildings dotted around the map look defeated by the new nature that surrounds it. 
The eeriness of the shopping malls and cities is brought on by the lack of people inhabiting these spaces, since they were once built to be inhabited. Instead, it only exists to serve as proof of destruction, and a place where the souls of the dead congregate. Many, if not all of them, were once people who lived in this area. Edgenot City is a surreal place. It's a lot easier to get a good look around post-game since all those jellyfish BTs are gone. This is the closest we see to a big city. A lot of buildings still look to be almost intact, but Edgenot still has its fair share of destruction. Its vacancy is ominous, but also peaceful. Abandoned spaces like this make you imagine the scene when all the chaos took place, but you're limited with only seeing the aftermath. The environmental storytelling in Death Stranding is very much present, although some of the finer details are only available to those who really pay attention. Of course, I was completely drawn into this world which made it a lot easier to do so, and finding even the smallest things made the map feel a lot less empty. I didn't really pay much attention to the war zones that we visit during Cliff's chapters, since I was too preoccupied by not dying, so I went into the nightmare section in the safe house to see them again. It made me realise just how impressive the World War II area is especially. The buildings, the planes, the sounds were all impactful. I'm not someone who plays many shooters or anything like that, but this place felt so real. It's the same with the other battlefields too, they feel so legitimate. If expanded, you could probably have a whole game set in these areas alone. Their inclusion not only provided a different experience and setting within the game, it's also a testament to what is possible in video games. Just writing about this game's atmosphere and emotional realism makes me want to hop on and experience it again. It's something that I think keeps bringing back a lot of players. Death Stranding has a very unique aesthetic. Yoji Shinkawa and the team exercised their skill once again in creating a beautiful sci-fi art direction for this game. The interiors of the safe room and distribution centres were incredibly high-tech, matching the general aesthetic of the technology such as the use of blue light. The vehicles themselves possess an ultra-modern quality to them. The trikes, for example, merge from two front wheels into one, depending on your speed. The style of the technology makes it feel like it is all distributed from the same company, which it is. The Bridges logo plastered on everything is proof of its identity also. You have these futuristic scenes juxtaposed against a natural backdrop, seemingly out of place, like how a valley of fluffy moss will lead you to the man-made structure of the incinerator. This just shows that the Death Stranding is trying its best to rid the world of humanity, but it continues to survive, no matter the difficulty. You have a couple unique organisms existing in this world too, one being the cryptobiotes, which are related to the seam. Then you also have sandalweed, a plant which can be used on your feet should you find yourself with damaged boots and no spares. I've never had to use them myself as I was always well equipped, but it's interesting that its existence seems almost entirely based on aiding porters, especially with its perfectly foot-shaped leaves. Humanity and nature are both adapting to this new world, sometimes aiding each other in turn. I've mentioned sound design briefly, and while it is subtle, it is actually very powerful. If you close your eyes for a second, you'll instantly recognise the following sounds if you've played the game. These effects have cemented themselves with the feeling of the atmosphere they are paired with, the validation of a like, the more action-oriented fights with mules, and the tense BT encounters each have their own impression on you, which is represented by a sound design too. Even the sounds of the Odradex sensor are enough to signify how close a BT is without a visual cue. The sound design is iconic, just like the alert sound from Metal Gear Solid. Also, this is pretty random, but I would love running around in tall grass or flowers, because of that super satisfying sound of them rushing against you. On that note, Death Stranding's score is some of the most incredible music I've ever heard in a game. It captures the essence of it, transporting you into the world even when you're not playing. If Isolation was an original soundtrack, this would be it. The songs are always appropriate for the scene or character it accompanies, and Ludwig Forsell, the composer, has done an outstanding job and 100% deserved the award for best score at the Game Awards. Thus, it was a really wholesome moment. Death Stranding. What? Thank you. Wow. What is going on? I don't know what to do. I like your colors. Oh my gosh, thank yeah. you so much. I like your colors as well. I love it when systems like respawning are given meaning and purpose in the game's story. Fast travel is a good example of this, as Fragile's powers and umbrella, which is actually a kind of compass, make teleportation possible in Death Stranding. 
When you die, you are sent to an area called the seam. This place reflects that in which you died in, except it is submerged underwater. This reflects upon the kind of purgatory this space is, a place between the living and the dead, our world and the beach. So it makes sense why it's a mix of the two. You'll notice other players' bodies, which, if you touch, apparently strengthens your connection with them. There are of course cryptobiotes present too. As I've said before, I believe cryptobiotes came from the seam in the first place, starting off as tardigrades that mutated into cryptobiotes by eating the coral in the seam. The seam is like a strand between beaches and the world of the living, but also between beaches themselves. Amelie proves this when she says that a seam has formed from her beach and the beaches of every soul in America. So not only does the seam perform a function in gameplay, specifically respawns, it is also very relevant to the story, and the structure of the world of Death Stranding as a whole. Hartman explains this phenomenon and what exactly it means in the process of death. He says, the Egyptians believed death not to be an instantaneous change of state, but a process. A process by which the soul moves from one realm to another. But this process itself has changed, thanks to the Death Stranding. In the normal order of things, when death occurs, the soul vacates the body and passes into the seam. From there it transitions to the beach, and only then onto the world of the dead. But after the stranding, a soul that has already made its journey to the beach may attempt to return to its body in this world. This is also why bodies are burned, as the body must be destroyed to sever the link with the soul. Only then would the soul be free to journey to the world beyond. In addition to this, it gives us a resolution too, as when we cut the umbilical cords of the BTs, they are able to finally complete their journey to the world of the dead, not stuck connected to the beach. I love how everything does actually make sense. Even though there is a fair amount to remember, once you analyse it, it does all fit together like one big puzzle piece of story elements, world structure and mechanics. Now it goes without saying that Death Stranding has a lot of incredible performances. I found myself invested in the characters' lives and personalities, which were given even more background in the form of mail and interviews. In fact, I was pleasantly surprised with how much they had to offer. Higgs Monaghan, for example, became my favourite character post-game, despite originally being a little disappointed with the amount of screen time he had. To start off, his name is derived from the God Particle, also known as the Higgs Boson. Essentially, Higgs is obsessed with the idea of power and importance. It's why he betrayed Fragile in the first place, because Amelie could give him amazing abilities like controlling Timefall and BTs. Rather than just relying on Fragile, he would have greater powers himself. He could fulfil the role of a bringer of destruction, far more crucial than that of just a porter, even if the cause was bad. This seems to have stemmed from his childhood. His father had died and his mother committed suicide, putting him in the care of his abusive uncle. When his uncle passed away, and it is implied that Higgs may have killed him in self-defence, young Higgs dragged his body into BT territory so it wouldn't cause a void out near the shelter. This is the point he gained his ability to see BTs, seemingly due to the exposure to them. So, in short, he had a pretty traumatic upbringing which we only learn about in his journals, which are optional to collect. At one point in his life, Higgs was a porter, and he became an important figure in the career world because of this ability he had. He finally had a purpose, and for a time, was actually a believer in the UCA and porters, which makes his demise into a power-hungry terrorist a tragedy on some level. When he partnered up with Fragile, you can see in the journals that he is starting to become more infatuated with Doom's abilities. This grew further upon meeting Amelie, who granted him the ability to control Timefall, BTs, and even teleport. Higgs's powers were unmatched. He wasn't really someone to ever have control, like how he was the victim of a horrible childhood, and even when he became a leader in the Porter community, he craved more. It could also be argued that Dooms drove Higgs even closer to madness, as it is known to affect the sufferer's mental health, causing high rates of suicide in those who have it. Or like the mules obsessed with deliveries, Higgs was determined to deliver the end of the world. I want to bring attention to the real-life Higgs boson for a second, namely Francois Engler and Peter Higgs, who were theorists that did a lot for the discovery of the God Particle. And if you put together their names, say Peter Engler, some of you might recognise that name. You know, a certain pizza-loving prepper. Of course, the game reveals that Higgs is Peter Engler via mail, but the detail is really cool, and this plot twist can be predicted if you know the trivia. You've basically been delivering Higgs's dinner all this time, which was funny. And after defeating Higgs in Chapter 9, he even opens up his shelter for you to access. Despite its size, this is my favourite location in the game. I absolutely love small spaces like these filled with the personality of its owner. You can learn a lot about Higgs just from exploring this room. 
Here we see he has all those pizza boxes you delivered lying around, and there is writing on the wall to say he only likes hot pizza, not cold. He is indeed very passionate about the temperature of his pizza. It's also obvious he has a deep obsession with Sam, with photos of him covering the walls and erratic writing scribbled everywhere. You can sense his hatred towards Sam, whether that's because he's jealous of his importance or because he is a threat to his power and destructive goal. His god complex is more apparent than ever, as in his writing he attempts to convince himself that Sam won't be able to stop him, that he is nothing compared to him. The idea that importance doesn't match up with your supernatural abilities is something Higgs is struggling to come to terms with, slowly becoming angrier and more destructive in his desperate attempts to maintain control. Sam is just a porter, with no special abilities really. He can't even see BTs without a BB. It's his connections with others and his hard work that makes him important, but Higgs can't understand that. There's a corner of the room where there's writing that suggests he regrets what he did to Fragile, even for a brief moment. This makes me think he is a very unstable person, which makes it all the more appropriate for him to be named after the Higgs particle, which itself is very unstable, decaying into other particles almost immediately. Another thing is that I don't think Higgs is dead. For one, Fragile admits that she did not kill him on the beach, although we do hear gunshots. I think this may have been one of those scenes where someone is about to shoot the other person, but shoots into the air or something else instead. It happens while Fragile is with Higgs, and she probably would have said if he killed himself in front of her, but she doesn't. According to her, she left him there with the gun. It's also a small point and may have just been an error, but the pizza delivery missions are still available after chapter 9 and in the postgame. The pizza orders do correlate with points in the story, with anniversary pizza, which I believe was the anniversary of the explosion he caused in Middle Knot, and the last pizza, the one he orders before you confront him in chapter 9. He even sends you mail after you complete that chapter, revealing he is Peter Engler, and unlocks his room for you to visit. If he had died at that moment on the beach, he wouldn't have been able to send you a message, right? Nor would he have written that journal writing about his hopelessness and defeat. The reason I talk about Higgs so much is because a lot of his character and background is indirectly presented to us through his room, mail, and interviews. The other characters are fairly self-explanatory, with almost everything being told during cutscenes. It's Higgs who you have to put a bit more effort into, which I found to be a fun process piecing together exactly who he was and why he did what he did. There is another character whose presentation and history relies heavily on the interviews. In fact, she almost entirely exists within her report entries, as she's only mentioned once or twice in the cutscenes of the main story. Her journals build her character, and they give a lot of background to Sam's history as well. Lucy was a therapist, who was approached by Bridget to help Sam to try and help cure his aphanfossum phobia. She was born before the Death Stranding, and expresses her disbelief in the existence of the beach. In her second journal, she calls it a figment of our collective imagination. In her third journal, she meets with Bridget, who apologises for not being very present during Sam's childhood. She also says that Emily had mostly taken care of him in her absence, and suggests that their time spent together on the beach may be related to his current condition. In the fifth, Lucy is convinced she has found the cause of Sam's condition. She says, It is only natural to more highly regard those with whom we develop intimate emotional connection. For children, this can lead to veneration. Yet there is also an inherent contradiction in this. For divinity is distant by nature, even as we yearn to grow closer to it. I have come to the conclusion that this contradiction is at the root of Sam's aphanfossum phobia. In essence, he longed for a deeper relationship with Bridget and Amelie, but because of their role in the Death Stranding, they have in a way achieved the status of a goddess. Like a divine being, they are out of reach and are more concerned about fulfilling their role. Lucy even says that their one true love is American Reconstructionism. That's not to say they didn't love Sam, but they couldn't give him what he needed. According to Lucy, it was this inability to connect with his mother and sister, especially Amelie considering her sole existence on the beach, that caused his aphanfossum phobia. In the seventh journal entry, Sam tries to prove to Lucy that the beach is real. He kills himself in front of Lucy and repatriates. Lucy holds Sam, who didn't pull away, and this was the beginning of their intimate relationship. He needs someone he can be close to, be intimate with, someone outside his family, someone who isn't Bridget or Amelie, someone to whom he can reveal the whole of himself, someone who will devote themselves to him. Soon after, Lucy approaches Bridget with the news of their relationship, which Bridget approves of. Lucy falls pregnant with Sam not long after. However, she started having nightmares when she was around 28 weeks pregnant. 
Bridget tells her that she was sorry, that she hadn't known it would happen. She tells her that Lou is special, Lou has Sam's blood, and through her, Lucy was bound to the beach. Before I continue, I want to draw attention to the fact that she was 28 weeks pregnant, as Sam's BB is called BB28. It's the only notable mention of the number, and unfortunately I can't find any other concrete evidence to suggest that BB28 is actually Sam's baby with Lucy, but it is interesting to point out and I do think it's symbolic. I will touch upon this a bit more later. Sadly, report number 12 is Lucy's last. She says, There are pills on the table next to me that I just took. I've tried to make sense of it, but this was never my world. I was born into an older one, one without a beach, where the dead stayed buried and life moved on. Lucy couldn't handle the way the world was, with beaches and the dead not truly being dead. We are told that the nightmares that dooms cause can exacerbate mental illness and suicidal tendencies, so this seems to have been a huge factor in her demise. Lucy's body was not disposed of properly, since no one knew that she had passed until it was too late. The body necrotized and caused a void out. Sam lost both her and the baby Lou. Just like with Higgs' character, we have so much explained in the interviews. It gives another layer as to why Sam names his baby Lou as well. He still gets the chance of having a daughter. Some people may complain that these things should have been in cutscenes. However, the exclusion of this information in that particular form didn't damage the player's understanding of the story. Plus, these events happened quite some time before the events we play through, and I think too many flashbacks would have left no sense of mystery whatsoever. Like I said with Higgs's journal entries, we have to do our own digging to find out more about the past. The interview section also helped give closure for a lot of characters in terms of their individual stories. We find out that Fragile Express is back in business and joins Bridges. Dead Man is finally at peace with himself and his artificial birth. Heart Man has moved on and met a woman named Samantha. And Mama and Lochner are working on developing future technology, with hopes to see the stars again. All of the characters had a sad past, so it felt good knowing that they're in a better state. It provides a sense of stability in this unpredictable world. There's still a lot of work to be done, but everyone has their place and things are looking hopeful. None of the characters really die either, like how Mama exists within Lochner, and we don't see what exactly happens to Higgs. Even Amni and her beach just get disconnected, but I didn't really like her anyway since she's an extinction entity and all that. And Bridget and Amelie are technically the same person, so whatever. Speaking of which, I refuse to forgive Amelie for that Princess Beach line. Like Mario and Princess Beach. No! God, please, no! Instinctively, I tried shooting her at the end too. I do get irrationally upset when characters get killed off, so I'm personally glad no main characters really did. I also want to mention Tommy L. Jenkins and Darren Jacobs for their roles as Die Hard Man and Heart Man respectively. Their performances were fantastic, emotional, and a joy to watch. These guys definitely deserve a lot more attention, and I hope to see them in more future games too. The entire cast was brilliant, and there's genuinely no one else I could think of that would have fit those roles better. Within the game comes moments of typical Kojima silliness, moments which I loved. Heartman and Deadman provided a lot of comedic relief in a story full of death, extinction, and emotion. I found it hilarious when Deadman joined Sam in the shower to avoid being overheard, and also when Heartman took away 20 likes after Sam messed around with his turntable. Need to give them back a second later. I always just went along with the ride and I didn't take things too seriously. It made for a lot more enjoyable experience too, like making a big deal out of the monster energy placement and implying it affects the credibility of the game is a bit much. I find it pretty entertaining that you have a canister that turns water to monster energy. It's actually useful in replenishing your stamina too. You can also cover yourself with a hologram of a rock to hide yourself from mules, kind of like the new cardboard box. Oh, and I shouldn't forget the piss mushrooms either, where multiple players peeing in the same place will grow a patch of mushrooms that cryptobiotes inhabit, which you can then harvest. Insane? Yes, but it's fun. Even going to the toilet in the safe room has an actual function in making weapons, since Sam's body composition is different and anti-BT. Everything has its purpose, no matter how it may look at first. I often browse cute otter videos on YouTube, so seeing the inclusion of a sea otter hood made me very happy. It replicates the sounds and behaviour of an otter, and also helps you to swim. Conan O'Brien's character is the one to give it to you, which brings its silliness to a whole new level. 
This, however, doesn't bother me. I'm a big fan of Junji Ito and Sam Lake, so it was nice seeing them in the game. It was a weird sensation, because it didn't feel immersion-breaking to me, despite it reminding me of its connections and references to the real world. I think because Death Stranding was packed with fourth wall breaking, it all just fit. I mean, there are multiple instances where characters look dead at us, and our camera lens view is reinforced by the raindrops we see on our screen, and the cracks that appear when Sam punches us in the face. We are simultaneously an observer and participant. Even in the birthday message that Cliff gives on the player's birthday, he mentions it isn't for BB, aka Sam, and you'll notice the camera will shift from the pod's perspective to a normal camera lens, as we see BB Sam is still in his pod in the background, therefore meaning Cliff is now speaking to the player directly. Although we are Sam Porter Bridges, pretty much the saviour of mankind, we get pizza and figurine delivery missions. If you look at the things you're actually delivering, most of the time it's not something necessary. It's silly and playful. Yes, this is a post-apocalyptic world, but people are rebuilding and are often given meaning through their work or hobbies. Names like the doctor, the engineer, the collector, the film director. The basic human needs are covered, like food and medicine, but even art and play have their place. It's this that is in sync with the idea of Homo Ludens, the philosophy of Kojima Productions. Essentially, it discusses the importance of the play element of culture and society, and suggests that play is primary to and a necessary condition of the generation of culture. These preppers have given themselves meaning, and no matter how little meaning you may think someone like the Ludens fan might have, for example, what you deliver of his brings joy to others. Hobbies and play are so damn important. Open world jankiness is something to be expected to an extent, and I never had an issue with it that led me to be frustrated with the game. There are a lot of parts of the world you clearly aren't meant to traverse in a vehicle. The game shows you that. So instead of getting angry that I couldn't drive my vehicle over a huge rock, I would just drive around it or walk instead. We're so used to games that are incredibly lenient with how vehicles are driven so smoothly across certain terrains. So I like how Death Stranding is like, uh, no, you can't drive that here. There were times I had a good laugh when doing things you're not meant to, like driving a truck down a very steep mountain. Overall, you just have to enjoy Death Stranding for what it is. And what it comes down to is Kojima's style. This kind of comedy is right up my alley anyway, and I actually like long cinematics too. More so in this game because I think they're done really well. Oh. Finders keepers. After finishing the main story of Death Stranding, you get thrown into chapter 15, the post-game. Chronologically, it happens near the end of chapter 13, when Sam gets brought back from the beach, but before the inauguration happens. I personally found that this really was the best place to put the post-game chapter. You have the BTs and Lou still, so you'll be able to continue the same experience and still be in line with the story-related events. You also have all those standard orders that you didn't complete in the main story, so there's definitely still a lot you can do even at this point, like getting an S rank on all deliveries. Now although this free roam chapter seems never ending, I wonder if it really is. Seeing how Kojima implemented a secret ending in Metal Gear Solid 5, which was set to be unlocked via multiplayer collaboration, it wouldn't surprise me if there was something similar in Death Stranding, considering just how crucial the multiplayer aspects are in the game too. I'm really curious as to what will trigger the secret ending if it really does exist. Perhaps we have to collectively reach a certain amount of likes. Who knows? I just feel like having a secret ending like that would be a very Kojima thing to do. London Bridge is Falling Down is a traditional nursery rhyme that we hear Amelie sing. It represents the goal of the UCA, and is all about maintaining and rebuilding. It's even more relevant that it's a bridge considering the company name Bridges. In an interview with Deadman, he covers the London Bridge, saying, Before I joined Bridges, I watched an old movie called My Fair Lady. It's about a flower girl called Eliza. I heard that My Fair Lady might have something to do with London Bridge. You know the song, right? They start out trying to build it back up with wood and clay, and then they finish it with gold and silver. There was a reading of the film that said Eliza symbolised the bridge, or something along those lines. But that reminds me of a far more sinister theory, that the fair lady in that song is actually an immurement, a sacrifice buried alive in the foundations of the bridge to keep it standing. I think this is an allusion to Amelie, likening her to Eliza, as she is a sacrifice to ensure the bridge stays standing. In the same way, Sam had to sacrifice his connection with Amelie in order to save bridges and the world. 
Despite all this talk of bridges, they aren't the perfect organisation. They hid the development and use of BBs, and essentially used them as human sacrifices. You could also say that the BBs were sacrificed in order to keep the bridge standing too, just like Amelie. Bridges even go so far as to cultivate an attitude towards BBs that dictates they are just equipment, along with implementing a termination protocol. Overall, their treatment of them is incredibly inhumane for an organisation all about saving humanity. It's also interesting that Deadman mentions that London Bridge was first built back up with wood and clay, but finished with silver and gold. It reminds me of how when we level up our structures, the third and final level of them has a lot of gold accents. The UCA road pavers play the London Bridge tune too when you donate materials. <laughs> Again feeding into the theme of collaborative reconstructionism, as you and other players supply resources to build the roads around the map, creating bridges from place to place. The UCA also seems to use the chiral network as a form of surveillance, best illustrated when Deadman hops into the shower with Sam to avoid being overheard by Die Hardman, and similarly when Hartman fakes his death cycle. Two, one. I modified the log times. Headquarters will have no record of what we say. While a force for good, the chiral network can be used invasively, and so in a sense takes away people's freedoms, a life that, in the end, Sam chooses to reject. In terms of Death Stranding symbolism, the imagery of rainbows is used very often. We see a lot of inverted rainbows which are missing the colour blue, and in the presence of Timefall, for example, and Deadman has the following to say about it. Timefall strengthens an area's connection to the beach. This has something to do with chiral particles becoming excited. In spaces connected to the beach, electromagnetic waves with a blue wavelength can travel easily through the scene, eking out onto the beach. Some people think that's where the blue from the inverted rainbow goes. Blue is described as the colour of the dead. This could explain why people appear a greyish blue colour when dead and sent to the beach. Like how Heartman was blue when his heart stopped, and when he was resuscitated, he returned to his normal colour. Another small point is that when you die, a golden blue strand will be in the place that you died in. Blue seems to be the colour of death, and I'd say gold is the colour of chiralium and symbolically the beach, so the choice of these two colours looks to be very deliberate. When we collect chiral crystals, an inverted rainbow appears. Picking them up creates a burst of shimmering chiral dust, which looks to encourage these rainbows to form, as well as the moisture in the area. These chiral crystals grow in areas of timefall, but are also available when disposing of BTs. Disconnecting the BTs makes the chiralium crystallise, and what's interesting about this process is that crystallisation is often connected to symmetry, and symmetry is a factor of chirality. It's no wonder that the chiral crystals are in the shape of a pair of hands, which are typical imagery of chirality, but are also representative of the theme of connection. We often hear about shaking hands in reference to our disconnected society. Because of this heavy concentration of chiralium and the addition of timefall, it's no surprise an individual inverted rainbow appears when you harvest the crystals, signalling a very strong presence of the beach. These chiral crystals can be used to power floating carriers, but are arguably more important when it comes to construction. They are used to upgrade and build structures, roads, and fabricate equipment. These crystals are a necessity for fast production of these things, and clearly seem to possess some sort of electromagnetic charge, which is something I discussed in my previous theory video. Anyway, enough of the crystals, let's get back to rainbows. At the very end of the game, Sam walks outside the incinerator building with Lou, it's raining, but it's not time for since they aren't affected by it. A few seconds later, the rain stops, and we see a normal rainbow. The colour blue is present, and the rainbow isn't inverted. If we remember what Deadman said about the blue and the rainbow leaking out through the seam and onto the beach, then the appearance of a normal rainbow would mean that the seam and therefore the beach are no longer connected to us. The world has returned to normal. No BTs, no timefall, no death stranding. Obviously, this chronologically takes place after the post-game chapter we play, where BTs and Timefall are very much present. Even when Lou was dying, we could see her turning into a BT. It was what happened between then and them going outside that was the pivotal moment, specifically when Lou grabs the brooch, the brooch made from Bridget's umbilical cord. We wove these from President Strand's DNA. They serve as a single knot that binds us all. The umbilical cord is best analysed by scenes with Deadman and Heartman like the following. It appears to be an umbilical cord. Human by the looks of it, I think. 
But this was no ordinary conduit between fetus and placenta. It looks more like a BT's tether. The umbilical cord was taken from Bridget Strand. I removed it in secret. The cord wasn't attached to a fetus. It was outside her body. She asked me to take care of it. Said it was the key to unlocking the death stranding. The cord shows no sign of decomposition or necrotization. Almost as if it's frozen in time. The president's cord was somehow connected to the beach. And that allowed it to escape the flow of time. In the same way that BTs are connected to the beach through their umbilical cords, so was Bridget to Amelie, who existed purely on the beach. So thanks to Lou's body making contact with the umbilical cord brooch, and thus the beach, Lou's soul was able to return to her body. Now this is a slightly wilder theory, but Sam's baby with Lucy, who is also called Lou, had Sam's blood and was connected to the beach. Assuming that this Lou was a repatriate like him, which may have been possible, it could very well be that this Lou was stuck in the seam all this time, and was then at this moment reincarnated into the new Lou. I still think that this is the same Lou that Sam had during the game, and his baby with Lucy is long gone. But I wanted to mention the crazy possibility anyway. I personally took it as Sam having a second chance at fatherhood, and paying tribute to his first daughter. And like how Cliff saw Sam as his bridge to the future, Lou seems to be the bridge to Sam's. Bringing Sam back to life is what set the Death Stranding in motion, and bringing Lou back is what ended it. It could also be argued that Amelie may have revived Lou just in the same way as she did with Sam all those years ago. However, Deadman said previously that Amelie had cut off her beach already, but then again this may not have been the case. Either way, it is implied in the very end scene that the BTs and Timefall have been eradicated, meaning a true disconnection of the beach. A lot of people may be wondering who the five figures are, and at the very beginning, I thought they were just symbolising each of the five extinction events. But it was only while editing this video I came up with something. My own personal interpretation of this is that they are in fact representative of characters in the game that Sam has a connection with. At the end of the game when Sam is stuck on the beach, Amelie, now in a silvery white dress, tells him he is still connected, and she points to the sky to show the five figures. Thanks to still being connected, Sam is able to be brought back. Later, Deadman explains how they found Sam, revealing that it was the revolver that they used to get to him. This revolver is connected to a few characters. First, Die Hard Man gives Cliff the gun to shoot his wife Lisa, and escape the facility with his BB. Then, once Cliff is cornered, Die Hard Man takes the revolver, which Bridget then pulls the trigger to kill Cliff and accidentally BB too. When BB's soul is sent to the beach, that's when Amelie gives Sam the ability to repatriate. So in total, the revolver is connected to six characters. Die Hard Man, Cliff, Lisa, Sam, Bridget, and Amelie. I believe that the figure in the middle of the five silhouettes is Amelie holding baby Sam, as we see the arms crossed in that way. They also look to be wearing a dress or long skirt, and there is a particular poster of Amelie which this pose reminds me of. That would then mean the other four figures are Die Hard Man, Cliff, Lisa, and Bridget. But that's just my theory. The gun that set this whole mess in motion ends up being the key to saving you. Mm. I'm away. She said it had another purpose. Not a weapon, but a lifeline. A stick that became a rope. The memory chips in the game are worth paying attention to. They have some film and music inspirations, figures, motorbikes, and fragile objects chucked in there. Plus, when you deliver memory chips, depending on what it is, the character to receive it will change. For example, Fragile collects the fragile objects and Deadman collects the figures. It matches their personalities and or their work. It's within these memory chips though that we can see a few personal statements or reflections from Kojima. He talks about inspirations and genre, like how without John Carpenter's Halloween, there would have been no Freddy, Jason, or Chucky. How one new concept can give birth to other variations of it. This could be referring to how he was inspired by other media, or how he believes Death Stranding will also go on to inspire other creations. He says how the movie The Walk provided audiences with an entirely new experience, something it has in common with Death Stranding. You take on the role of Sam, a delivery man, not something that is really a typical thing in games on this scale. Sure, you get delivery side quests in most open world games, but not a whole game based on it. 
Sam is just a porter at the end of the day. On a small scale, what he does is pretty unspectacular, but on a larger scale, you reconnect society and save mankind. Same as the walk, it's technically just about a guy walking, but the bigger picture is much more impressive than that, of course. You follow the journeys of both Sam in Death Stranding and Philippe in The Walk, both of which are done in different ways to most films and games. They're new viewpoints, not generic concepts. It's also funny how walking on a tightrope would require good balance, and Death Stranding's traversal mechanics focus on exactly this. This movie very well may have inspired this too. My favourite entry is the one for Dr. Strangelove, as it mentions how Stanley Kubrick's next film, 2001 A Space Odyssey, was greeted with mixed reviews and didn't do too well at the box office. However, it has since redeemed itself and enjoys a reputation as an all-time classic. I think this is a cheeky reference to what Kojima predicted to be the reception of Death Stranding. I believe that Dr. Strangelove represents the Metal Gear series, and Death Stranding, his next big venture, is like a space odyssey. Hideo did something drastically different to his previous and very successful work, and it's no secret that Death Stranding wasn't as well met in terms of reviews in comparison to his previous work. Because the game is such a new experience, it's hard for a lot of people to really digest it and know how to feel about it. But I do believe that with time, it will be appreciated a lot more for what it's achieved. Maybe it will even become a weapon to surpass Metal Gear. If it wasn't clear enough, I loved every part of Death Stranding. It still baffles me how unique every part of it is. Like how did Kojima come up with the world story and characters? Obviously I am a Kojima stan, but I really do have immense respect for him and his team for making this game. It was a huge risk making something so different, and I have to say, I believe it paid off. Whether you like the game or not, it's made its place in video game history. Death Stranding is clearly an incredibly personal game to Kojima too. It heavily features the appearances and even personalities of his friends with a whole load of cameos. The game even mentions a lot of Nicholas Winding reference work for example too. Hideo tends to inject his life and his thoughts into his games, but I feel like with Death Stranding, it's a whole other level. In an article for Vulture, Kojima said that once he had left Konami and started his own studio to develop Death Stranding, he didn't tell his mother. He wanted to wait until he became a little successful, as he didn't want her to worry about him. Unfortunately, she passed during development. Kojima had this to say in his interview. The ghosts in the game, maybe my parents are one of them, seeing me in this world. I wanted to have that kind of metaphor, that within you, you're connected to the people that passed away. The article adds that Kojima admits to regretting not telling his mother about the game, and that he appears shaken as he says it. I felt so bad for him after reading this, and to have a game that revolves around the concept of death must have been a very reflective and personal exploration of this topic. His own emotional connection with this game goes much deeper than one might initially think, and that only makes me respect him more. I didn't want Death Stranding to end, and yeah, I can always revisit it, which I'm sure I will. I just feel like I'm so damn satisfied with the 90 hours that I played, and I couldn't be happier. I feel like the length was perfect too, with a meaningful platinum trophy to work for. Having followed this game for so long, and for it to have been so enjoyable, has been the most satisfying gaming moment of my life. There's a lot to unpack in this game, and I've probably only touched upon half of it in this video, and even that's generous. But it's the analysis and discussions that come out of this experience that I find to be the cherry on top of the cake. I seriously look forward to Kojima Productions' next project, whatever that may be, and I hope that this game has inspired more creative and risky games in the AAA sphere. I'm feeling confident with the future of gaming, and hope others do too. Thank you for watching.